You're listening to the Sabina Road Baptist Sermon Series. We hope this message greatly impacts your life. For more information on the mission and ministries of Sabina Road Baptist Church in Tucson, Arizona, visit us online at sabinaroad.org. Please turn with me in your Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. The title of today's message is Valuable Vessels. Most of you are familiar with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1946. It was uh, some of the oldest biblical manuscripts to ever be found. They were in this, uh, they weren't in Jerusalem proper. They were in the desert in the Qumran community in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and, And they were accidentally found by people throwing stones into these little caves. And they found the Dead Sea Scrolls. And the Dead Sea Scrolls are worth untold millions of dollars and maybe more. Hundreds of millions of dollars. They're the most accurate, the oldest biblical manuscripts to date that we've ever found. We're in those caves. But here's the interesting part I want to pay attention to today. Not the untold treasure of the Dead Sea Scrolls, but what they were found in. The Dead Sea Scrolls, most of them were found in simple clay pots. Ordinary pots, ordinary jars, worth virtually nothing. And yet they contain a treasure that is immeasurable. See, God entrusts His priceless gospel with ordinary people like you and me. The world does not prize ordinary people, but God prizes ordinary people. My prayer today is that you would let Christ speak to you about loving Him and loving service to Him. Look at me in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Our main text today is going to be verse 7, but uh, I am going to call an audible here and we'll read, just so we get some context for the passage, we'll read verse, uh, verses 1 through 6 um, as well. Read along with me. The Apostle Paul writes, Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. For we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways, refused to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word, by the, by the open statement of the truth, we would condemn ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are preaching. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel and the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. But what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And verse 7, our text for today. (coughs) But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, you are good to us. Lord, what a beautiful name it is to celebrate the wonderful name of Jesus. Lord, we lift up high the name of Jesus Christ today. Lord, would you speak to us today? Remove distractions, remove frustrations or worries that keep us from listening to you. And God, would you meet with us? Be present with us. 
love you, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We have several points I want to look at today. The first one is this. We are to learn to treasure Christ. Look at the beginning part of verse 7. It says, but we have this treasure. So when it says, but, we understand that we don't get a look at that in isolation. So he says, but introduces a contrast. This is the first part of the verse. So he's obviously contrasting uh, the verse in the section before that. It says, but. So he's contrasting verse 6, which describes the incalculable glory of the eternal God revealed in Christ. Look again with me in verse 6. You'll understand real quickly that you want to have your Bibles when I'm preaching, okay? So look at verse 6. It says, For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So the treasure here represents the gospel ministry and the gospel message which is given to all believers. Look a couple of verses back. Look, look at verse 1 and we see he's talking about the gospel ministry as well as the message. Look at verse 1. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God. When Paul's talking about treasure, that's the treasure that he's talking about. We understand what Paul's talking about. We had to back it up a couple of verses. You don't have to turn there, but it might come up on the screen here in a second. Colossians chapter 2, verses 3 through 9. Talks about the incalculable work of this treasure because of its relationship to Christ. One of my favorite verses in Scripture are these verses here. Colossians 2, verse 3 to 9 says this, In whom, talking about Jesus, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And in verse 9 says this, For in Him the whole fullness of deity dwells on. The gospel message reveals the most profound truths the world has ever known. Do you understand that, friend? Plato, Socrates, none of them can hold a candle to the gospel truth of Jesus Christ. Are you with me, church? Okay, I'm just making sure. I'm already a little bored up here, so I'm going to need a little help, okay? All right. The gospel message reveals the most profound truth the world has ever known, which produces eternal effects. Through the gospel, people are freed from the power of sin and death, released from condemnation, transformed to the image of Jesus Christ, and given eternal joy, peace, and satisfaction. I'm telling you, there is no greater truth than gospel truth. There is no greater treasure than Jesus Christ and His gospel message. You know when you were a little kid or, or maybe when you're an adult and you watch the, the stories of maybe a, 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 about a pirate adventure or maybe a, a great uh, treasure hunt and, and they'd find this kind of old leathery treasure map, right? And, and, uh, and on it it had different kind of emblems of, of where you had to go and, and uh, then it had where the treasure was at and it was always marked by something. So what, what was the treasure marked by, friends? X marks the spot, right? I'm going to make this connection, which is not a, uh, an actual connection, but it helped me remember. See, the, the early church, they would actually um, use the letter, uh, what we would call X, um, to, to symbolize Christ. It was the first letter uh, in the name for Christ in Greek, which means key. And so they would say, Christ is X. They would just write X. So they'd write key. Isn't that true for us, man? There is no greater treasure. There is no greater glory. There is no thing, nothing higher or worthy of praise than the person of Jesus Christ. And if this church is going to accomplish anything for God's kingdom, it must learn to treasure Jesus Christ above all things. Amen. Preaching is great and singing is wonderful and baptisms and those are all, I love all those things. But I'm telling you, without a church that treasures Jesus Christ, then let's hang it up. We love, we treasure Jesus Christ and the gospel message. C.S. Lewis wrote this, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen. Not only because I see 
see it, but because by it, I see everything else. See, through faith, through the gospel message, we finally see things as they are. The Bible says this world is temporary, friends. It's fleeting. It's flesh and blood. We'll come to an end one day. Hopefully not soon. This building will crumble. This world will be destroyed and be remade. But the gospel allows us to see eternally. It sees, help us see what matters. What relationships that we should be investing in. My hope as your new pastor is that you learn to treasure Christ. His gospel that you see its immense value above all things. Learn to treasure Christ. We are to live as jars of clay. Look at verse 7. We have this treasure that we just talked about in jars of clay and simple pots. See, jars of clay, these vessels were just common pots, cheap, breakable, Easily replaceable and virtually valueless. I, I have a couple of them over here. Well, I've got some, some clay pots. These are from the, the Qumran uh, site. These are about 2,000 years old. and uh, Even as old as they are, they're worth virtually nothing. But they're fragile. And the only thing that ever made these clay pots special is what they carried in Little kid, if you want, if the little kids want to take a look at them afterwards, I'd, I'd love to show them off. But break, fragile. This is what the Apostle Paul, through the Holy Spirit, compares us to. These jars, these pots, were used for everyday, unglamorous purposes. Sometimes they would be used to carry human waste or garbage and on very rare occasions would store something of value. It's important to understand, church, the image of a vessel is a recurring one in Scripture. Vessels are made to be filled, but if they're going to be filled, they must be pure. They must be clean and and uh, 2 Timothy talks about being useful to the master, talking about vessels that are useful. But if we're going to be useful, church, we've got to be pure. We have to be clean vessels. The reason why many people rejected Paul's message is because he was just an ordinary guy. Paul says in his letters on many different occasions that I wasn't very eloquent. He says, I, uh, I, I, I didn't come to you with strong arguments and speech. He says, I was I really not all that special. And, and it's, it's likely just from um, church history that Paul was, had eye conditions and maybe been disfigured from his beheadings. But gospel, I'm oh, sorry, from his beheadings, from his beatings. Uh, uh, that's right. <laughs> I'm glad somebody chuckled over there. I wouldn't even caught that. Thank you, chuckling. And, uh, but Paul understood that he had no value in himself, and it was only through the Savior that he brought, had life. Well, my little ones, they might like this one. Everybody awake over here? Paying attention, little ones? Now, this is a special puppet in our house. He's named Monkey McGregor. I'm not going to do the funny voice that I normally do with it at the house, but maybe you have the privilege one day. But Monkey McGregor by himself is kind of boring, right? He is lifeless. He is inanimate. But he's a vessel, right? Because he's a puppet. When Monkey McGregor is still, comes to life. Bless you. He can talk. He can wiggle. He can sing. And I'm not going to do any of those things right now, okay? <laughs> but he's a vessel. And it's only when he is used by his master does he come to life. The Bible says, friends, that we were dead in our trespasses. We were dead in our sin. It was only when Christ had made us alive through the Holy Spirit, then we can do stuff for His kingdom. Then we become truly alive for the first time. 
that God has placed. The treasure of the gospel ministry and frail, ordinary humans just like you and me. Paul was merely another in a long line of clay pots that God had successfully used all throughout his kingdom. And that's what I feel like as your new pastor, is that I am just a, another clay pot and a line of good clay pots that God has used in the decades of this church and, and that I hope that God uses me. But I recognize who I am as nothing more than a clay pot. I encourage you, church, to humbly embrace your high calling. Those things don't usually line up, right? Humbly embracing a high calling, but this is what God has called us to do. To humbly embrace that we have been called by our Savior to be vessels for His gospel. And let's look at this third point. Let Christ be glorified. But we have this treasure, the gospel ministry, in jars of clay, which is weak, frail people. For what? To show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. The grand message of Christ was carried through the world by ordinary, weak people for this purpose, to show Christ glory. Amen, Pastor. That was good. That's right. Okay. We'll try it again. The grand message of Christ was carried through the world by ordinary, weak people. For what purpose? To show Christ glory. And you say, Amen. That's a great part for it. Hey, everybody's awake. We're just checking here, okay? We're in the home stretch. See, the required requirements for spiritual usefulness is to be humble. To see oneself for what one really is. And oh, man, I, you know, I, I'm never going to mount anything. I, I'm no good. That's not humility, friends. That's false humility. And false humility is not humility. Humility is seeing yourself for who you really are in God's eyes. We do this by acknowledging that all the glory for one's accomplishments belongs to God. Which is completely opposite than what our world does. Isn't it? Our world is full of self-glorification. I want you to know how great I am. And I'm willing to sing about it. I'm willing to shout about it. I want to put my title on anything and everything. This is what the world loves. Self-glorification. But the gospel says the complete opposite of that, friends. It says if you want to be honored, then you must first make yourself low. And Christ and His time will exalt you. See, His glory, His glory equals your good. Now this goes against our human nature because we feel the overwhelming desire to make sure people think that we are great. But the Bible says when you are focused on Christ's glory, it is going to be for your good because you are designed to glory in Christ. Every aspect of your life and your home life and your personal life and your church life, every aspect of your life is to bring Christ glory. Whether you drink or whether you eat or whatever you do, we do it for God's glory. See, by using frail, fallible people, God makes it clear the power lies in the divine message and not the messenger. I'm telling you, folks, I'm nothing special. I'm just another clay pot. You're just another clay pot. But God has allowed the divine message of the gospel to dwell in you. God wants you to be His representative to this world. That's unbelievable. This is exactly what we are to do. Frail, ordinary people. To give God glory. Several years back when I was a child and we had a a big Easter production in our church, and it was a really big church. It was always pretty 
exciting and it was getting to the end and had gone off without a hitch up to this point and that it was it was moving towards the climax where Jesus would come out and after the, of the empty tomb and reveal himself and, and Jesus Christ is honored in glory, right? We've all seen these productions, but things didn't go according to plan. And, and uh, the, 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 the stone had been rolled away. The Roman soldiers were lying on, unconscious on the ground. Jesus Christ uh, was a, a, a substitute for Jesus Christ, was about to make his uh, debut. And before that happened, uh, the mighty stone fell over and landed on the Roman soldier. And, uh, <laughs> and the Roman soldier, this, this mighty stone that should not be able, be able to move by one person, was picked up by this supposed to be unconscious Roman soldier with one hand, set it up onto the, the tomb, and uh, the church was laughing hysterically, and there was uproarious laughter, and, and it kind of messed up the whole thing. And, and, th and, and this, this guy pretending to be the Roman soldier, he did not mean to upstage Jesus Christ, but that's exactly what he did. And if we're not careful, friends, in our own lives, when we say, I want the glory. I want people to know I did it. I want people to think I'm fantastic. I'm great. And all the while, we're, we're, we're standing in front of Jesus Christ. So you stay back there. I want you to look at me. I want you to know about me. See, in ancient Israel, God's glory resided in the Ark of the Covenant as a symbol of His presence among His people. You guys know that. In 1 Samuel chapter 4, we know that the Ark was stolen. The Ark of the Covenant, that is. It was stolen. And a lot of bad things happened that day. The Ark was stolen because it was Israel was defeated in battle because they'd been living in sin. And we know that the priest Eli, he falls off a high place and breaks his neck and dies. And there is this lady, she is the daughter-in-law of Eli, and her, um, her husband also dies in battle. So the, the priest dies. The ark is stolen and her husband dies and she's pregnant. And in a tragedy and grief, she prematurely has her baby. And she names it a name that we're familiar with. She names it Ichabod. Ichabod, she names it. Which literally means inglorious or there is no glory. And she says that when people ask, why are you going to name your kid child? She said, because the glory has departed from Israel. And I wonder, how many churches today the glory of the Lord departed long ago and they didn't even know it. That Ichabod was written on that church and they were busy doing churchy things, had a lot of great programs, but they didn't treasure Christ. They didn't treasure the gospel. And Ichabod, the glory of God, had left long ago. And maybe they didn't even know. Never take the glory of God for granted in your midst and in this church. Lest we wake up and find Ichabod. No glory written on these church walls. Let Christ be glorified in this church. Let Christ be glorified in your life. And there is no limit to what God will do through this church. We must never waver from loving Christ and loving service to our Christ. My prayer to the cross would be the glory of this church. Not a pastor or a new pastor and his preaching or great singing or all programs, but the cross would be what we glory in in this church. As we move into the invitation time today, this is the challenge of God's Word. Can I ask you this question, friend? Do you treasure Christ? Do you treasure Jesus Christ? 
And so, oh, yeah, yeah, of course I do. But does your time, does your wallet, does your heart reflect that? That you treasure Jesus Christ above all things. What do you say? I, I, I want that prestige. I want the power. I want people to know my name. Did you treasure Christ? Can I ask you this question? Are you letting Christ use you? This week? This month? This year? Reflect on your life during this invitation time. Can you say that Christ has used you? If not, it's a time of repentance. Say, Lord, forgive me that I have wasted what you have given me. But Christ is not far away. His forgiveness is here. So Lord, forgive me. I, I, I want to be right with you. I want to be used by you. Do you know Christ? I'm new here. I don't know you. And you don't know me. But I wonder, is there anybody in this room say, I'm not sure I really do know Christ. You know, I've gone to church. I've done churchy things. I may have been baptized. But there, there's not been a time in my life when I recognized that I was a sinner, condemned by a holy God, and I realized I could not save myself. I turned from my sin and trusted Christ to be my Savior. I turned from being my own Savior, and I turned to Christ. Has there been a time in your life when you've done that? No need to be ashamed of that. Be embarrassed when, when the music team, the praise team comes up here in a couple minutes. Come forward and talk with me. I, I want to talk with you about following Christ. You say, I can't do that. That's okay. Come with one of your friends or talk with one of your friends about knowing Christ. Don't leave here unsure of where you will spend eternity. Has the Lord led you to join this church? You want to be a part of this fellowship and what the Lord's doing here? Come forward during the invitation time. Talk with me and we'll celebrate that with you. Well, let's go to the Lord and pray. Father, you are good. We have used feeble, fragile vessels to hold your glorious gospel. But help that to humble us, but also strengthen us that you have loved us enough to do so. Lord, pray that you would speak to hearts right now. Lord, that you would remove distractions. Lord, you help us. Focus our eyes, focus our hearts on you. Help us to obey, love you, and ask the same Jesus' name. Amen.